Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to, I'm not going to say another episode of the Hudson Valley Squares, because this is the first episode of the Hudson Valley Squares meets in the prog seat, the crossover you've all been waiting for. Welcome to Monday Night Must See TV. We got most of the crew here. Let me introduce uh, everybody. I'm going to start from the bottom. We've got from in the prog seat, we've got Chuck Alvarez. We've got from the Hudson Valley Squares, Nick Franco. Also for okay. the Hudson Valley Squares, the Count himself, Ralph Tambora. From in the prog seat, George Lemmy. From in the prog seat, Ken Golden. From the Hudson Valley Squares and the Monsters Den, Mr. Chris Allo. From the Hudson Valley Squares, Ryan Scow. From in the prog seat and for Fusion Friday, George, I forgot to mention you're from for, for Fusion Friday as well, Eric Porter. And from damn near every show we've ever done on this channel, Mr. Lewis Nasser. What's up, gentlemen? Good evening. Hey. What's up? So the theme of today is to kind of talk about heavy bands, metal bands that kind of went prog for an album or two or whatever, and prog bands that maybe got a little heavy for a bit. So I've asked everybody to kind of look at stuff they're familiar with and pick out some examples. And we're going to talk about why some of these bands went in one direction or the other and why those albums kind of sound heavy, what made them heavy or what made them kind of prog, right? So uh, that's kind of where we're going to go with this. We're going to start off. We're going to start. Mr. Nasser is going to go first. All yes. right. I'll turn it over to you, my friend. All right. So I'm going to get things started with two very obvious but very good picks, I think. Um, one of them is a Swedish band called Anecdoten. I don't know how many of you guys have heard these dudes. Um, I am picking in particular one of the earlier albums. I believe this is their second album, uh, Nucleus. This is essentially what would happen if you take 70s era King Crimson and you really fuzzed it up and made it really chunky. It's um, it's It's really, really great stuff. I, this was the first record by them I ever heard. And shortly thereafter, I got to watch them play at Baja Prague. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that thing. It was a very strange but very wonderful festival in Mexicali, Mexico. Uh, Mexicali, this is, this is my first choice. Um, they have lots of albums. Well, not lots, but they have six or seven. They get a little softer, but this is where they really turned up the, the fuzz and the distortion. This is a very heavy record. Um <clears throat> It's not really characteristic of their later albums, but it's a very, very good one. Um, my second choice is a band that um, is not usually talked about, but which I really love. Um, they were always invited to prog festivals and they played opening slots for bands like the Flower Kings when they toured. So I guess in a way they were prog. To my way of thinking about it, they were always pretty heavy. It was a trio. It was three brothers. They are no longer together because Paul, the youngest, died a few years ago. Um, the drummer. So it's, I'm talking about a band called Kopecki. I don't know if you can see. It's, it's, it's not easy to read. Kopecki, Blood. This is about. This was the last album they put out together. And I always played in the anniversary of Paul's passing. The last time I ever saw them play was the last show they played as a band. They were opening for um, the Flower Kings here at Martyrs in Chicago. And after they played and the Flower Kings hit, and I'm not hating on the Flower Kings, but I really had to leave. Because <laughs> it, it was like, you know, Donnie and Marie following Sabbath. It just didn't make sense to me. So I just had to get out. <laughs> That's quite um, a <laughs> So, but if, if you're not familiar with these dudes, I would highly recommend you get them. The records are all over the place. Some of them were released by Musea. Um, this one, the latest one, uh, Unicorn. Um, you can find them. They're not super expensive or anything. They're great. Um, Joe Kopecki, the guitar player, he's got chops. The secret sauce for this band, though, is William Kopecki, the bass player. He plays some of the best fretless bass you can hear. And he just, he just amazing guy. And finally, uh, and here this may be a little bit controversial, but um, when, I, when I was given this assignment, I was thinking, all right, so what, what does Pete mean by heavy? Does it mean a lot of distortion or does it mean heavy in intention and heavy in statistical density and heavy in darkness? You know, to me, 
personally, there is nothing heavier than a symphonic orchestra playing Bartok. And I don't give a fuck who you are. I, I, I've seen Meshuga. I love Emperor. But Bartok with a well-tuned orchestra rips them a new ass every time. It's not even a contest. And um, this band in particular, I think that they do a very good job of capturing that level of heaviness. So it's kind of like, uh, without distortion, but it, it's it's um, it's like Sabbath meets Bartok in a weird way. It's a band from Belgium. They're called Universe Zero. And this album is called Heresy. Especially that album. This album, for all you super metal dudes. I'm writing it down, to, man. You need to get this down. shit right now. Heresy Zero. You will not be disappointed. And I, 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 between Ryan and Nick, you guys have made many recommendations over the years that I have been buying and fucking loving. That's why I'm writing it down. I'm going to check it out as soon as the show's This over. shit is awesome. So those are my three. And I hand it over to... To whoever's next. That that's a very frightening, scary, and wonderful album all at the same time. Mm-hmm. But it's but it's also heavy. Yeah, it's it heavy. Is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I mean, just, just look, just look at the fucking cover. Yeah, just look at these Talk fucking about- guys. You don't want to meet these guys anywhere. I don't want to meet them at the food court of the mall. They'll hit you all soon. soon. <laughs> they 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 yeah, these they guys are a little. The yeah, they don't even need the e on the end of the word unit. That's how heavy they are. They just drop yeah. the E. They're it's so the heavy that the E just fall off. That's right. It, 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 it's the Belgian, it the Belgian French, but yeah. That's right. I'm I'm just, would you buy, would you buy a cheesesteak at the mall from those guys? Uh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Listen, I like cheesesteak, so I, you know. Chris would gamble on that one. It's like Sabbath yeah. cheesesteaks. Because you look heavy. Yeah, yeah. They're They're great. I will say, um, so if you go back to Kopecky for a, a minute, so William Kopecky, the bass player, he also plays in another band called High Q Funeral, right? High Q Funeral is a is a, a yeah, it's like a prog metal, dark metal band. It's, like, it's almost like black metal too. I think yeah, black that. metal. Yeah, and Nick French and Ryan band. Really dig them. Yeah. What was the name of that band again? High Q Funeral. And then and then he also plays with Far Corner. Which is heavy in the in the sense that Universe Zero is heavy, but less so. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's no softies there. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. There's gonna be no ballads in any of that shit. But, but um, yeah, William Kopecky is a phenomenal musician. He's a great dude as well. We've been friends for many years. But that's not why I endorse him. The guy kicks ass. I think of our generation of players, he's the best, without a doubt. Cool. All right, Mr. Scow, what do you got for us tonight? Uh, I don't know. I gave this a lot of thought, and I kind of had this this idea in my head that I was going to get three bands and like tie them all together. Uh, maybe not like member wise, but like influence. And I, I feel like I might have. So let's we'll see how this works out. Uh, so first, what I want to do is not a band, but it's a man. Uh, one of my favorite musicians in the two bands he was in. I kind of feel like exemplify a little bit of this on both ends. His first band was a little more space rock and not so much on his first band, his first big band than uh, Prague, but that band was Hawkwind. That man is Lemmy. Mm-hmm. And the album was one of the first things he did with him, and that is Space Ritual. Yes. Uh, with, with his, uh, mm-hmm. I play guitar, bass like a guitarist, but you know what? Uh, especially the way they recorded the bass tone on this album, it's fucking great. It's just, I understand that you learn to play live on stage with them, but mm-hmm. awesome. Love it. Born to go. I, I transition that. From, I'm like, you know what? Because that's first, the first thing I thought of was these two live albums, the two iconic live albums that this guy played on, you know, No Sleep and uh, Space Ritual here. And uh, yeah, the guy, you know, is, obviously he is distorted. He distorted his bass much more when he went over the Motorhead versus Hawkwind. Mm-hmm. But the playing style obviously was the same style, that very distinct, you know, he's like, what did he say once? He's like, I don't really play like a bass player. I play like a deep guitarist or like a very, you know, down tuned guitarist, which fit both those bands. It certainly fit this these live albums. Uh you know, everybody knows Lemmy, everybody knows Hawkwind, Motorhead, so there's not too much to say about that. So then I thought one of my favorite bands uh from the 80s, primarily the 80s, drew influence from both those realms, prog, space rock, and like heavy shit. You know, Motorhead was obviously the godfathers of thrash metal. 
and all mm-hmm. crazy metal that came after and motorhead were kind of like you know the, the capstone on the pyramid the foundation so what band better exemplified that than uh Voivod. Mm-hmm. and uh so we're gonna start 1984 first Voivod album yep. and these guys were great the guy I said this on the show a lot of times they were the one band you know if you read other uh, drummer away who's the main guy that's been in the band their entire tenure uh, he gave an inf- interview a couple of years ago where he discussed some of his biggest influences. And on one side, he had bands like GBH and Venom, you know, like these early British metal punk bands. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of that, you know, the old Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd, and stuff like Van de Graaff Generator. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like what Voivod always sounded like. Just like a little bit of, you know, that Van de Graaff Generator meets like Motorhead and Venom. So this first album is like very post-apocalyptic, thrashy, like kind of Mad Max, Road Warrior, End of the World. But you can hear that stuff kind of that unique voice kind of seeping through, you know, it doesn't really sound like a lot of those other bands do. It's simplistic in a way, but not like Motorhead, you know, it's straight ahead. But every album after that, though, they kept churning along, getting a little different, getting a little proggier as they went. 90s end of 1989, they signed to a big label and they put out their fifth album, uh, Nothing Face, Nothing Face. Mm-hmm. which is uh, good to my head, my favorite prog metal album of all time. They were leading up to it. Second album is kind of like a Slayerish album. Third album, Killing Technology. This one is pure thrash metal, but you know, very distinct in their way. The fourth album, Dimension Hatros, is like kind of thrash, kind of prog, very weird out there. It's a concept album about you know traveling through space and time, trying to get away from these uh, intergalactic uh, like police force kind of guys, you know, chasing after the protagonist, but in a very weird you know kind of trip that way. And then they come out with this album, which is just out of control it's got a great pink floyd cover on it which i think is the only song of theirs that ever had any radio play um uh, yeah i just love this album so then we're to go from there uh so now i'm going to go off the deep end a little bit because i gotta gotta mention some obscure shit nice so at the That's end of I'm the 80s at the end of the 80s as uh things were winding up for hardcore for metal for punk a uh a genre emerged from england called grindcore uh which is the furthest away from Prague as heavy music can get uh, basically, what these band, what the grindcore bands did, and the first grindcore band, uh, probably the most notable one was Napalm Death. Have you ever heard mm-hmm. that? Love what it. they did was they took punk, they took hardcore, they took thrash metal, they compacted the songs down to like usually under a minute. They made things as fast as possible. You know, they stripped all the instrumentation down. You know, the drums were just a simple single, uh, single kick drum blast beats. They really simplified it, right? So, what does this have anything to do with prog? Uh, a couple weeks ago, I went down to St. Vitus in Brooklyn, and I saw a band called a grindcore band called Gridlink. This cover is really cool too. We're gonna drag out the vinyl for this. Gridlink. Uh, Gridlink. So here, here's here's how I'm kind of uh I'm 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 stretching here, but this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so the the main the main uh, the the singer for Gridlink was a individual by the name of John Chang. And before Grilling, he was in another grindcore band, which is probably even noisier, called The Scordon's Axis. This was their third album from 2000. And uh, I'm going to try to relate this to Pride. I was thinking a lot of how I'm going to say this here, because it's kind of a stretch. You're going to listen to this album, you're like, no, 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 I don't think so. But uh, when Chang started off in The Scordon's Axis in the early 90s, uh, the first album he put out with them was called Ulterior, which is a lot like Napalm Death. It is like super fast and violent, hardcore punk, a little death metal. There's nothing proggy about it at all. Real short songs, choppy to the point. No, uh, you know, just fast, simple, violent, and fun. But as these bands went on, as, as uh, Discord and Saxon went on, and then as, as newer band, Grid League, went on, uh, it's I listened to this stuff, and the way they recompose these songs, it's like they take an entire, I guess like a five-minute Voivod song. This is how I always heard it in my head. It's like they take a four- or five-minute Voivod song, and they pack it down to 30 seconds, but as all the intricacies and technicalities and nuance and stuff is in there, it is just sm- sped up and like packed into this little cube, like super fast cube. But it's not just like playing, you know, it's not just strumming. It's not just uh, there's a lot of intricacy to the guitar, which is hard to do when you're playing these little like miniature symphonies. Uh, the guitarist for this band was named as Rob Martin. And he had to get out of music for a while because he developed, I think, something to do with tendonitis or some some hearing condition would really impair his ability to play. So that kind of put Discordance Axis on the uh, back burner for a long time. Starts this new bag, Gridlink, and I have to want to pronounce this guitarist's name right. Uh, it's Japanese, Takafumi Matsubara. So uh, both of these guys, as I hear these bands over here, I'm like, this sounds a lot like Voivod, you know, Piggy, obviously the guitarist mm-hmm. of Voivod, uh, but just a lot more dense. And then I read an interview not that long ago 
where John Chang, the singer, is like, that's the one band that ties these guys together is they were Voivod fanatics, you know, mm -hmm. so they come into this playing this grindcore style, but is like worshippers of Piggy and his style of playing. I'm like, that's it. Because that's what it sounded like. This really intricate, technical, but super, super, super fast music just like packed into these little cubes of a uh, grindcore which is very unorthodox for the style. Most grind bands just get in there, you know, blast and the song's done. You know, they don't go for that mm -hmm. level of nuance. So that is how I'm vaguely kind of sort of maybe tying into prog in a weird way. I don't know. Listen to what you'd like. This is very noisy. Uh, this album in particular is a, it is like a, just a hurricane. I don't know how else to describe it. I saw them. They only ever played about a dozen shows. And I saw one of them by accident at CBGB's once. Cause we went down to CBGB's in Manhattan to see, I think it was the Dillinger Escape Plan, another band, a long time ago, like 27 years ago. <clears throat> we got there late and we missed them. And we're like, well, fuck it, we're here. Let's go in and see the band, whoever's playing next. And everybody I went with is like, ah, I don't know who's playing. Let's just go back home. We missed it. And I'm like, no, I came all the way down to Manhattan. I'm going to go in. So I went in by myself and I saw these guys play one of their only shows ever. And it was like having artillery shells launched on my head. And it was great. <laughs> I, just want to try. I think it's on YouTube, but the quality kind of sucks. But that's uh, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. All right. Nice. Having artillery shells launched at my head. Uh, <laughs> the the video on YouTube don't really capture it, but the drum. So the drummer for these guys plays in a band now called Municipal Waste, which is like kind of like a modern thrashy, you know, kind of like a fun thrash band. It does not do justice. What this guy could do. This guy is like Keith Moon combined with uh, uh, Mick Harris from Napalm Death, like times two. It's just like it's just all ferocity, you know, fast, very precise, but fast. But like, you know, when it comes to that single kick blast beat, like you have to be like, you know, locked in real tight and he nails it on this stuff. So love the guy. Looks like a computer repairman too, which is awesome. Very unassuming. <laughs> All right. Oh, I got Let's see. George. Uh, I, when this came up, I found myself having a problem coming up with prog bands that I thought went convincingly heavy. So I'm going through my collection and I ended up finding more heavy bands that I was convinced went prog. So I, that's what I ended up with. The first one, like Ryan's, is a guy, not a band, which is Chris Poland. He's in on the first two Megadeth albums. Everybody knows that. Great playing on those albums. Mm -hmm. Develops a heroin habit like everybody else in the band. He goes to rehab, so he's out of the band. Then he ends up playing bass for uh, Circle Jerks, but does that for a couple of years, never recorded with them. Comes out of that, finally decides to make another band, and it's a prog metal band of all things, called Damn the Machine. Oh, yeah. Like everything Chris Poland does, there's really no comparators for it. Uh, the most one I see is Fate's Warning. It would be more the Arch era Fate's Warning because it's mm -hmm. too heavy to be 90s Fate's Warning. So it's kind of like that, but shorter songs. Uh, Poland's style is the same. You, you can't, his leads don't sound like anybody else's leads. Somehow they got signed to AM Records, which is like, you know, nothing like this on that whole label's history. So eventually they do get dropped. This is a one and done. And then he went on to a band called Mumble's Brain. And he's just been a, finally found his real true self in 2003 with a band called Ohm, which is actually Jazz Fusion. So dude is all over the place. But uh, for, at the time that this came out, it was like, wow, the Megadeth guy's playing prog metal. It's like really, really strange. My second one is from New York, a band called Toxic. They, the first album to me, World Circus, is a pretty run-of-the-mill thrash album from 87. Bad production, screechy vocals, simple drumming. It's kind of just your standard thrash fare. And they put this out in 89. This is over the top. This is super progressive stuff. Really incredible arrangements. The lead playing on here is absolutely off the charts. Josh Christian, an incredible guitar player. Um, the drumming, everything. This is a quintessential Step It Up album. It sounds like the tough same band from the first album, which just yacked up to the sky. All the, 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 the faders are turned up to 10 on this thing. This is a really progressive. I heard this on a AM station here, and I was like, what the hell is this? I went to the store to get it, not knowing the album name, and I got World Circus. So I was like, Ey. But then I went back to get this, and I was like, yeah, this is it. This singer, very melodic, unlike the guy in the first album. Uh, 
it's just everything about this. This is one of my favorite albums of the 80s, prog albums. The last one, I'm sure a lot of people in the comments will have a stink about, but uh, as Ryan would say, I don't give a flippity fuck. <laughs> Avenged Sevenfold. Uh, nope. First two albums are metalcore, and then a couple albums after that, they finally may have some success on the radio. That's why everybody hates them. Those are kind of like trad metal meets power metal, American power metal. Then they do this horrible album that sounds like they're trying to recreate Black Album Metallica. So at that point, I'm not even paying any attention. Out of the blue, in 2016, they dropped this album, The Stage. And to show they're not fucking around, the first single is eight and a half minutes. And there's all this uh, time changes, the metric modulation. The rest of the album, I, I pick up the album. There's all kinds of uh, intricacies on this album. There's a uh, a song with uh, a 15 and a half minute song with uh, a voiceover from Neil deGrasse Tyson about the origins of the universe and what's more prog than that. There's uh, there's one tune with a horn section line from the, with the guys from Fishbone. There's another tune with a full orchestra. I mean, this, again, this resembles the band that they were in some ways, but it, everything's just yacked up. And the proof that the thought of like, is it really Prague is like half the Event Sevenfold bands hated this. They were just like, what is this? You know, this is just like not for us anymore. So I go with Event Sevenfold, the stage. Cool. Some good choices there. Nice. All right. Mr. Allo. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if I did this wrong because I didn't pick any like obscure band but uh okay it could be right well, yeah it didn't have to be obscure. Quote, ryan and george i don't give a flippity fuck so uh um, trademark that shit put it on a shirt <laughs> that's right <laughs> um, i know when, when pete was like yeah a heavy band that that went proggy uh i went with my personal favorite band black sabbath uh they went you know somewhat proggy on uh sabbath buddy sabbath and uh sabotage um you know to me those are you know, uh, Sabotage is their, their sixth album to me. That's the end of the classic era of the original band uh, because Technical Ecstasy was their queen album and Never Say Die, just the less said about that, the better. Um, but yeah, they kind of got, um, you know, with Sabbath, 40 Sabbath, they started really experimenting. Uh, they used a Mellotron, piano, synthesizers, they pulled in uh, Rick Wakeman, Wakeman from um, from Yes, uh, who plays uh, piano and mini move on the track uh, Sabra Cadabra. Uh, and he definitely seems like the coolest guy in Yes. I'm not a Yes fan, but uh, any guy that walks around in a fucking There's game, no doubt. Uh, There's no fucking I, doubt. I, <laughs> um, I, I reread for this the uh, uh, Iron Man uh, book from, uh, from Tony Iommi. And yeah, here's my... I did have him sign the inside, and uh, he said how Yes did a, a 32 date uh, North American tour with Sabbath, and uh, Yes guys did not get along with the Sabbath guys, except for Rick Wakeman. And uh, Rick Wakeman actually, it says in the book, did not get along with the rest of Yes. So <laughs> Rick would travel on the Sabbath tour bus, and of course they would party every night. And then when it came time to uh, record sabbath buddy sabbath they they had rick guest on the record and they paid him in beer which which was all he wanted and um yeah he was he was so friendly with them that at one point he wanted to join sabbath and it says in the book tony's like yeah we were we were totally not good enough to have rick wakeman join black <laughs> sabbath he's like we, we we needed something uh something simple but apparently they must have been really good friends because um Years later, Adam Wakeman, Rick's son, joins uh, Ozzy's solo band and then spent years uh, touring uh, with Sabbath as their keyboardist. Um, and, and I looked up, I wrote down the quote, what, a couple quotes from what Tony said on Sabbath, Buddy Sabbath. He said, I worked really hard on that album. I tried a lot of different stuff. It was a matter of constantly being in the studio and creating new sounds. And he said, um, I find that the music compared to the previous records has more class about it, more arrangements, more shine, and it's more adventurous. And it was the pinnacle. 
he said at, at that point. Um, so uh, yeah, obviously Tony has a has a high opinion of that record, like like most people. And, mm-hmm. and Sabotage kind of kind of continue that. Uh, you know, has two big prog rock uh, style epics with Megalomania and the Rit. You know, one is ten minutes, one is nine minutes. Has keyboards and synthesizers. Uh, you know, Megalomania starts out slow and moody and trippy for like three minutes before going into like an explosive six minute mm-hmm. prog rock track with lots of time changes and stereo effects. And, you know, a lot of people think that that's like Ozzy's best vocal performance ever. And much um, agreed. Yeah. You know, the Rit is another one that uh, definitely has a prog rock influence at nine, almost nine minutes. You know, has a lot of uh, a lot of dynamics to it. Opens with Ozzy just 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 blasting vocals, and gets calm and just get changes and, and gets lighter. It's it's all over the place. And uh, the one song that I actually didn't think was was prog rock uh, was "Symptom of the Universe." But Tony Iommi said in Iron Man, he said "Symptom of the Universe" has been described as the very first progressive metal song, and I won't disagree with that. I was like, huh. I was like, that's pretty interesting. And uh, Tony said the sound of the band was harder on Sabotage than on Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. And my guitar sound was harder as well. But Sabotage did not sell as well as all the previous albums uh, did in the past. Uh, But yeah, to me, that's definitely the end, you know, prog influence or not, that's the end of uh, of an era uh, of Sabbath's great early days. Mm-hmm. You know, compared to uh, why they wound up but yeah that's my that's my pick yeah and ironically sabbath does those two albums really at the height of prog rock in general right you got all yeah. those big selling yes and tall and genesis albums elp all right around the same time so why not try and do something that's sort of like that right still pretty yeah, heavy, though. Mm-hmm. yeah. cool mr golden yes what do you got for us um it turns out mostly what I have here is instrumental, but uh, that wasn't by intent. It just kind of worked out that way. I see, um, I see Eric is pretty excited about that. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, you know, when we talked about this, you know, my, you know, I can't think of any prog rock bands which are as heavy. I mean, there's no corpse vomit in here. You know, there's nothing, there's not, nothing on that level, you know. So uh, I think I have a corpse. It, 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 it's it, you know it, it's it's all relative. Heaviness is is relative. So by prog rock standards, the stuff I pick is heavy. So the first one I picked is very important album, uh, recorded in 1970. It's by Guru Guru, mm-hmm. called UFO, and yep. this, is, this is one of the first Krat rock albums. Two of the guys in the band, Manny Newmeyer, the drummer, incredible drummer. And the bass player, Uli Trepte, they came out of the free jazz scene in Germany. They played with the uh, Irene Schweitzer trio. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guitar player, Axe Geinrich, he just, he's just like, his guitar solos just peel the paint off the walls. Uh, it's, it's, and the rhythm section is very, very intense. It's the sound of three guys that are basically just tripping their brains out. But somehow it's, it has a fairly composed feel to it. It's, it's, you know, it's not, totally out there's some sense of melody it's uh it's really considered a landmark album it's it's a very important crowd rock album uh that's the first one i have second one this one this one is maybe the most obscure album that gets talked about tonight uh it's a one and done band from the uk they were called automatic fine tuning nice yeah the the album is aft Never got never got a CD reissue. I mean, it, there's a CD reissue, but it's not a legit CD reissue. I'm not sure why Esoteric hasn't uh, hasn't done it. Um, they were they were just completely uncommercial, and it's kind of amazing that Charisma Records signed them in, in the first place. This was 1976, and Prague was kind of winding up. They had it. They had a twin guitar attack that was kind of like Wishbone Ash but much heavier and far more intricate. And I think Wishbone Ash as a hard rock prog band, I think I think of what they do is kind of intricate between the two guitar players. These guys take it to another level. Uh, the album is one song split up between the two sides. It's a track called The Great Pan- Panjandrum Wheel, parts one and two. A uh, lot of unison, 
uh, playing, alternating leads. Very intricate. It's heavy. And there was nothing else like it at the time. Not that I could think of. Um, there's a short track at the end that has some vocals, but and maybe if they would have emphasized the vocals, maybe they would have had some success. But I mean, these guys, they sank without a trace. And I think of it as like proto tech metal. Uh, it's a great, great album. And, you know, you could really annoy your neighbors with this one. <laughs> uh, the third one I came up with is also kind of a landmark album. It's from Japan. It's a uh, flower traveling band. It's called Satori. And uh, you, Ryan, you know the album? Oh, I love that album. Yeah, it's a great album. Awesome. So, so they started out. They started out actually their first album, one of the great covers. I don't know if I could show this, but they were naked riding on their motorcycles, and they are. Uh, and this, this album uh, was kind of sucks. It's it's all cover <laughs> tunes, and they have a great singer, Joe Yamanaka. He had a three octave range, and he was like a sort of like a cross between like Ozzy and Rob Halford. Uh, but like, you know, he mispronounces, they do house of the rising sun, but it's house of the lising sun. It's, 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 it's really bad. Satori, on the other hand, this was, this was just incredible. Uh, it came out in 71. It was essentially kind of an in, improvised piece and it's one track Satori split up. Well, it's in five parts. Uh, Black Sabbath was a, very strong influence on these guys but the music the overall feel of the album is more psychedelic and experimental the guitar player Hideki Ishima his, his solos are are phenomenal and Joe the singer Joe Yamanaka he doesn't really sing much in the way of lyrics it's just using his voice as an instrument uh, and you know given the time frame this was 1971 this was sort of like kind of like the origins of doom metal in a way. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it has that feel to it. And uh, yeah, I, I very important. It's kind of weird. They, they moved to Toronto. They got popular in Canada. So they, they, they moved to Toronto and, uh, and they, they had some success there, moved back to Japan and uh, their sound changed a bit. They, they made two more albums that kind of, they weren't on the level of Satori. Satori Satori's one of the greats. That's what I got. Ooh, good choices. And that I will say that automatic fine tuning album is terrific. Yeah. You guys it's heard just, it. Really it's just strange. Flower that... Traveling Band, too. I love that album. I play that a lot. That is I'm gonna have to get that Flower Traveling album. Never heard it. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, like it's psychedelic it's weird. Sound. Yeah, it's weird, but it's a good. It's good. Um yeah, it's um, I, I'm certain I have it on vinyl, a copy on vinyl. I can't find it. So it, it, you can see the the cover art itself is just fantastic. There's there's all kinds of there's all kinds of crazy shit going on in there. It's <laughs> great, great record and have heavy. But again, we're talking, you know, we're talking prog rock heavy. You know, psychedelic heavy. We're not talking, you know, metal heavy, but heavy. So in other words, Ken, it's not Slayer, right? Not quite Slayer. It's not no, 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 no. no. But you know, but it's good. Your 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 neighbors wouldn't appreciate it. But there you go. That's the important thing. Yeah. Cool. That's what all righty. The counts, Mr. Ralph. What do you got? All right. So all all three of mine do have a little bit of a connection because they're all thrash related, and they uh, all had albums out at around the same time. I guess first I'll start with a band from Switzerland, three-piece band. It's not Celtic Frost, but Corner. This is their uh, their demo from 86. And Tom Warrior from Celtic Frost actually sings on all the songs but one of them on this demo. But their first album, R.I.P., uh, it had signs of prog as far as being like technical thrash, but they were more just a full on kind of thrash band. But then they, they, their next album, they came out with Punishment for Decadence. Mm -hmm. The song Max, Mask Jackal used to be uh, on Headbangers Ball a few times, uh, the video for that, but uh, really a masterpiece album. And you, you could really hear a lot of technical prog elements, and they just constantly. Every album they would get more proggy, but it always kept it heavy. 
in their last album, they kind of went a little bit more groove metal and they lost some of the technicality. And I, I don't really like that as much, but uh, their, their second album that punishment for decadence is a total masterpiece. Love them. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt. I was almost going to do like the thing where you, you just pick like a, a musician and follow his career. So I I'm wearing, it looks like I'm wearing a possessed shirt, but I'm wearing a primus shirt. I thought it was kind of perfect because, uh, you know, Les and Larry Lalande were both in this thrash metal band called Blind Blind Illusion. That's a great album. Yep. And uh, Larry so Lalande, from one of the very first, considered the first death metal kind of album of all time, Seven Churches by Possessed. And uh, that's why when they toured with Slayer, they, they decided to to make a shirt that represented the, the old school uh elements from Larry Lalande, but uh that's not one of my picks. My next pick is uh Atheist. They start off with this really brutal, heavy thrash, borderline death metal. But then I mean there's even technical and prog elements in that album, but then uh, they had a bass player, Roger Patterson, who died in a car crash. The band got into a car crash and he was one of the best bassists at the time. And they got a great replacement on the next album with unquestionable presence. And they really show a ton of prog elements on this album, but they still keep it really heavy. And then they break into the, these instrumental prog parts that are really cool. And they just get more and more proggy as they go on. But they always kept the, the heavy vocals. They didn't like switch it so much where you didn't recognize who they were. They just added a lot more prog to them. And then uh, my other, my final band would be DBC. They only put out two great albums at the time. The first one, like, was really thrash, crossover, hardcore kind of elements to them. But they, they were such great musicians from Canada. But then their second album, they, they started to go more in like a Voivodish kind of direction with the, with the album Universe. And this is, this is such an amazing album. These both of these albums, I can't listen to one without putting the other one on. And even though they're so different from each other, I just I I, I play them together all the time. But the universe, they starts off with the Genesis explosion, and it's like a spacey, it's just crazy, uh, really heavy still, but really way more technical. And they slowed things down a little bit, but the drums are still really fast. And I just thought they were a perfect uh thing to mention in this they also put out this which is like their demo anthology which shows they were a little more raw when they first started out but they definitely got more proggy and then you know the guitar player died in the 90s and then the drummer died on his 61st birthday in in oh. 2019 and um so we i always wondered what what would it they they would have been like if they just continued from universe on like how much more proggy they would have got but at the time, all these bands had these albums out in like 88, 89. And um, the, like the, the scene was being so flooded at the time that this was like a breath of fresh air to have bands trying to experiment a little bit and add new elements to it. So they didn't all sound the same, you know, the DBC, they would have kept going. I just I, I think they would have been like Voivod where they just would have kept reinventing themselves and becoming cooler and cooler as time went on. I wish they would have continued, but. Yeah, that's my three. Cool. I had to look up the uh, so I forgot his name, but it was Tommy Barron, the guitarist for Coroner. And that, that dude is one of the most underrated like metal guitarists ever. He could shred his ass off. He had such like a great rhythm technique, and those guys are like the, the perfect like power trio for a thrash band. Oh, Usually, yeah. you don't think of like thrash as like a power trio format, but like the way they kind of interplay with each other, they were all phenomenal musicians. And it's still thrash. It's not, they don't go off in like weird directions. It's like balls out thrash, but. They had such a cool way of doing it that, yeah, they were really like a unique. I fucking love those guys. And That's he ended cool. up joining Corner, I mean, Creator later on. And yeah. uh, Creator, Creator and Corner both played the Hudson Valley in, in Middletown at a place called the Rock Palace that had no stage. And that day they did an in-store at Rock Fantasy. And I got to be a roadie for them for the day. And I got in for free to the show. And I got to smoke up with them on the bus. And uh, the guys in Corner didn't even really speak English. And uh, it was awesome because they played us, Creator played us the nothing face, I think, at the time where it was no vocals. It was just the music. And we got to sit there 
And when we, we moved like two cabinets in and we got in for free and they say, creator was, we were like, yo, what do you need done? And they were like, get us cocaine. And we were like, Whoa. we tried to make a few phone calls and stuff. And uh, they didn't like the prices that we were coming up with. <laughs> and uh, we were like, yo, we got some killer bus. Though. So they were like, all right, let's smoke up. And we got in the bus with Corner and Creator and we smoked them up. And it, we had some killer bud. And it, they played that Voivod. And it was just such a memorable uh, experience. I got a, I got an autograph, No More Color uh, uh, album flap signed by all the guys in Corner and shit. That's cool. Yeah, they are. Jesse played Middletown twice. Corner. They they came back and played with Nuclear Assault at the class. So that was pretty cool. Little class. Oh, and, uh, I'll go back later when we do comments on everything else. And I will say that uh, that that second base player and atheist Tony Choi, tremendous tremendous bass player. Oh yeah. Who also played with Pestilence and played with Cynic for a little bit and yeah, really talented guy. They were really lucky to get him because the Randy Patterson at the time when we heard that first atheist album, you you couldn't help but just hear that bass like that. Yeah, it was you very know, fun. Really playing that, you know, I think even like Death was like I think. Death would have fucking recruited him eventually if they could have, because they were from the same area and stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah. they, they, they were putting out uh, individual thought patterns or human right around the same time as that uh, unquestionable presence came out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right, Eric. Well, I think somebody else said this where I had a lot of trouble with this. Um, and I think the bands that I picked kind of more dabbled, maybe brought elements of heavier music in i'm going to start with i guess what i thought was obvious um porcupine tree where these guys kind of started as a floyd band very spacey as they i guess progressed stuff like signify started getting a little heavier um but this album to me fear of a blank planet i love the guitar tones i feel like they get very heavy they have some um, metal elements that they brought in. I don't think they left the prog, you know, that I think that was my biggest issue, Pete, was trying to find bands that maybe completely transitioned. But I think you can hear a lot of metal influence. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say they did probably four albums in a row that were pretty damn heavy right. compared to where they started. Exactly. Well, it, it was the Opeth connection, right? Yes. Yeah. Agreed. In, yeah. in absentia, so, I thought it was... Yeah, I thought like blackest eyes and stuff, but I I think the guitar tones on this one really were what did it to me. I mean, when they went full on like uh, even the title track and anesthetize, and I think they really you know they could get pretty heavy. You guys, you may not agree, but um, to me that <laughs> that was <laughs> that was pretty heavy for my listening. Um, now, Ken, these these are your guys, Morgable. Oh yeah. Fusion, um, rock, jazz, whatever. But I think Christoph, the guitar player, Christoph Godin, if I said that correctly, Ken, yep. killer. And these guys, it's a, a trio on this. This is my favorite jazz for the deaf. But I mean, they same thing. I think they bring some pretty heavy elements into their music. So even if you're like, you can kind of go both sides, you know, both sides of the fence. They can be jazzy. They can be rock. They get pretty heavy. I absolutely love the guitar player. I think he's he's somebody who definitely should be more known than he is. Um, but I think you'd hear if you listen to it. I think you'd hear some definite metal influence. Oh yeah, yeah. in that band. No, they call they call what they do jazz metal. So yeah. yeah, I guess so. True. It's hard, you know. You look at that, Ken. I went out and looked at like rate your music and everything else, and you do. You see the, you know, you get a little bit of everything. So that's kind of where, you know, these guys. But it might be a band that. You know, if you're listening to the heavier stuff, they might not be on your radar. Um, but to me, they are. And I have to go with one of my favorites, Derek Sherinian. Um, he came up, obviously, I think Alice Cooper might be where people started hearing from him. He's played with Kiss. Uh, obviously, he had his tenure with Dream Theater. And then I think this one is, um, again, these are kind of screwy because he had a band, Planet X, but this is a solo record called Planet X. And Derek brings in, on this one in particular, it's Brett Garson, but he he loves Zach Wild. He plays with a lot of metal guys. I think Ingve's played on some of his tracks, Petrucci. Um, but this I find is is pretty proggy at times, but 
same thing. I mean, he he Derek always maintains that heaviness uh, throughout his solo albums. You can hear stuff that's fusiony, proggy, but he always has that ballsy side to his music um, that I think just is very heavy, um, but convincingly so. Yeah. So I believe, um, and that those are my three. Cool. Definitely some heavy stuff there. All right, I think we should go to like uh, places like Finland and Norway right about now. <laughs> Mr. Franco. You called? You got the floor, yes. <laughs> What's going on? Well, very interesting. A lot of very cool picks. Uh, a lot of stuff I've I've never heard of. So I think I'm coming in as one of the few pe- few times where I'm writing everyone, it all down. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote some too. <laughs> this is one of the few times where I think everyone will know my picks well. Um, so... Uh, thinking about this, especially like as you guys were talking, and and it, it puts you in mind of like you know what what is heavy, what is prog, and you know where does it all fit? And so my picks are basically um, three different artists. Uh, one I guess is an individual, and two are, are bands. Um, and one of the things you know when you're young, uh, and I'm probably you know a little younger than some of you, a little older than the others, but. You know, we all kind of grew up where when you're into metal, you hear a lot of people tell you, oh, those guys suck. They're just making noise. They're not talented. This, this, that. Now, we all obviously, and most of the people who watch this know that that's mm-hmm. bullshit. But when you're young and there's no internet and there's no groups and there's no Zoom meetings and it's just you and you have no friends, <laughs> you know, um, like it, it, you know, really weighs on you. So I remember one of the one of the keystone or keynote moments where I, or Keystone, right? Yeah. One of the moments where I knew that an artist that I liked who was insane and played super heavy music actually had more going on, and this is just beginning, was a, a Canadian artist, Devin Townsend, who I, I've talked about a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got into Devin Townsend the way a lot of people probably did with uh, Strappy Young Lad. Heavy, heavy is a mm-hmm. really heavy thing. Yep. This is mm-hmm. insanity. And I, I was attending a college, a community, co- well, a state college, but it was like, whatever, I was just taking classes. I took this music theory class or just music class where they just, um, and I remember, I don't remember much from it, but I remember the professor invited us all to everybody bring in an album and we're going to play that album in front of the class and big speakers or some of it and talk about it. And I knew I was probably one of the only people in that class that was into heavy music. So I brought in this. Yeah, yeah, like, like you know, because yeah, part of it was like, hey, let's see what these snotty people think of this. And I'll never forget the very, the very first song, um, "Syl," their namesake, uh, was being played. And if anybody's familiar with it, it starts out like, I mean, literally like smashing sounds, and then it goes into like an electronic beat, and then the the heaviness comes in, and it, it's very it's formulaic for a little bit, and then when like then there's a chorus that happens and the song goes off into a totally new direction. And I will never forget the professor who was already like rolling his <laughs> eyes. Like, I can't believe I let this kid play this stuff. Um, and all of a sudden he, I'll never forget. He kind of pursed his eyebrows and was like, well, I didn't expect that. And it's just one of those little moments I remember. And who knows, you know, after that, everybody's like, Oh, cool. That's really, really good. And I realized I'm like, wow. So it really, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take a lot of convincing of real music people that there is some unbelievable talent out there that you might come off as like, Oh, this is just like crazy speed metal. And then of course they followed it up with uh city, which oh this is God. one of the greatest albums I've ever heard in my life. And then obviously from there, Devin Townsend went on to have a solo career that is still going on. And he is somebody that I think has. And another thing about my picks are I've, you know, we were supposed to go from like Prague to heavy and then a band that goes from heavy to Prague. My picks, I think, Weeble Wobble, back and forth over that line. Mm -hmm. And Devin definitely did that because these things are so heavy, but yet they have these strange elements to them, technical, or they were very reckless, but they also had this structure underneath that was uh, unique and and took a lot of skill. And then as you can see, you know, as anyone who's followed Devin's career knows that he's made albums that are light and sweet and ethereal and then he's made stuff that's caustic and heavy and everything in between and he's definitely a great example of someone who can do both and who never let i mean he was almost like a passenger on the heavy metal train for a while and we we lucked out in the heavy metal world but he's gone on to many he has albums that are partly electronic psychedelic 
Um, and he's definitely somebody who I think um, he got to start with uh, Steve Vai, right? Didn't Steve Vai? Yeah. Him and he yeah. sang on one of his albums, like when he was really young, like early yeah, 90s. That was, that was the Sex and Religion album, which is a pretty crazy album. Right. Yeah, he right, was, because yeah. he, he did, what What year was that? Before 90, 90, 93. 93. Well, the first Strapping Young Lad was 95, and he was young on that album. And City yeah. was 97. He was young on that. And then he had, all, yeah. he had uh, Gene Hoagland from Dark Angel on that. But, but with Vi, he, am, I, am I wrong that he was just playing music that was already written, or was he taking part in that? He, I, I think, think he was just playing Vi's music. Yeah. I think. But, I but read I think, his book, and I, it was a long time ago. I think Vi wrote the album with him in mind as the vocalist. With him in mind. I don't think oh, okay. he was the songwriting. He's a phenomenal he's vocalist. Singer. He really yeah, is a great can, singer. He can do it all. Yeah. So, so Devin definitely comes to mind. There's plenty of examples in his discography. Um, and now, predictably enough, moving on to Scandinavian countries. Uh, you know, it, the word prog comes to mind when um, when black metal and prog are mentioned together. A lot of people think about Enslaved. Uh, yes. From Bergen, Norway. Yeah. And, you know, they're one of those bands that... Uh, you know, they got their start uh, with that whole crazy black metal wave that took place in the early, very early 90s. But, you know, when you when you get into the origins of the band, I remember seeing a little documentary series and the the singer of Enslaved, uh, Grutel, who is you can see here regaled in uh, Viking. He looks like he's going to cut somebody's head off. <laughs> um, he was he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. When he was a little kid, he was playing uh, the recorder. Uh, and he was playing Greek, uh, you know, and uh, so yes, whatever the dog is, yes, green um, with you. I do hear a dog, right? I'm not losing it. <laughs> no, that's just that's all in your head, man. <laughs> Please tell me you guys hear this dog. No, so uh, so yeah, so and you know, and then it's like, okay, he grew up in this artsy, and so did Ivar, the other guy in the band. Their parents were way into like probably Prague and like all kinds of rock and and classical and, and jazz. And then, you know, dump these kids into like, you know, hearing Kiss and then, you know, Venom and then Iron Maiden and Slayer. And it's like, you know, what a really unique soup to get you started uh, in, in a time when music was very, there was no internet, you know, you were isolated in a, in a small Scandinavian country and then you just get spoon fed these things that, that make it into your culture. And Kiss was very popular in the 80s in scandinavia so these guys got this taste of like these dark evil guys you know tongue in cheek they didn't know and and then they have this background in in real like technical music so um enslaved it starts out extremely heavy and and screeching vocals and super fast drumming but even on their earliest releases even on their did Yggdrasil demo that they did and like now you can hear on like all father odin and songs like that there are sections in those songs that are like what i would imagine are prog in the sense that their the timing is suddenly different and and even in their little studios and their and with their meager means they were they were bringing to bear a skill set that would lead to um you know what you have with like for example this album eld 1997 this song's 13, 14 minutes long on this song, on this album. And you're not writing a black metal song. Oh yeah. The new one is, is really good. I'm, I'm still like absorbing it. I just got it recently, but you're not writing songs that long unless you're adding, you know, different elements to the, to the mix. And they most certainly brought to bear prog elements, even from the early time. Now enslaved, who's had such a long career from 1991, um, I think they got a little too prog for me mm -hmm. uh, in like the mid, like 2002, 2004, they uh, experienced some lineup changes. They got real psychedelic with um, Monumention and which came out like around 2000, 2001. These guys listen to Pink Floyd. They have the background that I also explained. So they, they got real out there and it, it started to get a little too convoluted for me. I think music this heavy needs to have a, sense of you know like a like a sent not urgency but like it definitely needs to have like a get up and go and i know that they were kind of losing steam in that regard so they got a little too proggy and then fast forward to about ah, it's been a while now i'd say i'd say for about eight years now about four album cycles they suddenly started to remember their roots a bit and but they didn't lose that prog influence so to me their last four albums 
are just the best blending of those two factions of their background, right? They, they, their live shows got more energetic again. They, they, they have that, you know, real uh, paganistic Viking sort of flavor back, you know, and where they're chanting and clean, clean vocal lines, they're chanting like they're, they're from their language um, mixed in with the yelling and screaming and the blasting. And I think that because they're such good songwriters and because they have that prog background, they just know how to blend it so well. So that's a band that started out one way, came all the way this way and back the other way, you know, and, and Weeble Wobble, like I said, over it. And then uh, my last one, um, I, I picked uh, my one of my favorites there, Amorphous. Um, nice. And I, yeah, and I think where they, where Amorphous, um, it's interesting with them, especially with this, this conversation that we're doing here is that when they were kids in Finland, uh, they listened to grindcore and death metal. And that was their, that's all they wanted to be was was you know napalm death and carcass they were getting into all that stuff and they um and in fact they used to be called abhorrence and they, they two of the guys were in like a, another death metal band and they were just blasting away as hard and fast as they could and they caught the attention of relapse records over here but by the time relapse could get in touch with them they had dropped the name of abhorrence they picked the name amorphous which is taken from the word amorphous shapeless again why did this happen? When they were recording that first album with all the grind elements in it, they were sitting in the studio, you know, like this guy plays his parts, the other guys just sit there and drink. Somebody walked in famously with an album by a band called Kingston Wall. And I don't know how well known Kingston Wall is. I'd never heard of them. They're really friggin' good. And they're like a real, like, like a prog style band, like rock band. And they just put that album in there and these guys were just listening to it on repeat. And by the time they got done recording their death metal album, they were like, we want to do this. <laughs> so you can hear, and this is actually, I think this is with uh, Tales from the Thousand Lakes as well. They, they, cause you can see them starting to change in 1994, putting in these like folk elements, but also putting in these like prog elements with off time songs and, and different, you know, not just blasting along. Yeah. And it really came to fruition on 1996's Elegy album, which is where I guess the biggest blending of the psychedelic 70s uh, influence of Prague mixed with their metal. And one of the, one of the coolest things about that is that the, the keyboardist and, and uh, drummer that they had for that album were not metalheads at all. They didn't understand metal. They, 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 whatever. They just thought what Amorphous was doing was cool. And I think that that's really interesting. They came from jazz fusion backgrounds <clears throat> and you can, and you could just see that elegy was just this mix of, of elements. And they, they didn't even in the studio, the, the guy who was supposed to produce it shit the bed on them. And, and they wound up like, all right, well, we got to finish this album. And I think Ryan, you and I had a conversation about this once about how here's an album that I consider one of the greatest ever written being elegy um by amorphous and so many elements of putting that album together were completely by accident roughshod work with what we got you know like guys who aren't even to metal and yet they came together and made this unbelievable prog influenced metal album that i never even knew that until uh you told you told me because i didn't know i read the book yeah. you, you, you can't <laughs> tell by listening to it it's, yeah it i just I, you could tell i just read their biography yeah. amazing like i had no idea like so many elements of it were were accidental and from the prog world and uh, I just think that's so cool. And since then, they've gone a little prog. They've come back to heavy, and they mix it together. They have, they have keyboard solos that would make uh, any '80s Rush fan weep. You know, I mean, just like beautiful, beautiful elements of prog and metal that, when it's done right together, belongs together. And a sandwich, a prog. Actually, oh, you a, a big, a big thanks, man, because I I heard you talking with Ryan about Amorphous, mm. Pete. And I, I never even fucking heard that name. And I went out to the local here in Chicago, and Elegy was the only record they had by them. So I got a used copy, and I fell in love with it. And this yeah. fucking, it these great. fucking guys know what the fuck they're saying. So great after that, I, this is why I take fucking notes. Yeah. <laughs> didn't, they, didn't they do a Hawkwind cover? Yes, they did. They yeah. did on... Um... Oh God! On the lot, the lost son, the EP that they recorded at the same time as um, as Elegy, they did Levitation. 
You mentioned Kings of Wall. They were a very good band. They they had three albums, and uh, the guitar player Petra Wally committed suicide, jumped off a building. Yes, and they they that messed them up big time. They they discussed this in the Morpheus's book, and uh, they just they were in shock. They couldn't believe. And they were right there when it had, they like heard it, you know, obviously it was the same kind of town. Everybody like kind of knew each other. Yeah. That's the other element. They kind of Kingston wall was from right near. They were, they were kind of like a rising star at the time. They were yes. getting very popular. And if I remember correctly, Petra Wally's father, I think uh, was like a sixties or seventies rock stars of some sort in Finland. So yeah. Sammy Wally or something like that. And uh, yeah, they were, yep. good. they were a very good band really good yeah i checked them out as a result of amorphous and i was very impressed cool all right let's go to the bronx chuck yeah oh, man all right i'm gonna go a little the um, the art rock um realm and i'm gonna prove to you guys that these guys over here are pretty heavy you know you already saw my list of what i was going to put out there the first one is an album from 1971 from a band called the move and this is a um, message um Message from the country. Like, uh, if anybody knows anything about the move, um, one of the bands that did make them very famous, actually two people made them famous, both um, Todd Rundgren and um, What's a Cheap Trick, uh, wound up um, covering songs from them, you know, Do Ya, um, and also California Man. But um, the move is also the band that actually um, uh, came in right before ELO. So, uh, Jeff Lynn was part of the band for two of the albums, for two actually for two of the albums um the album before that looking on and the next one message from the country and it's on this album and so that they became a bit more heavier it's probably their most heaviest album of the four albums that they came out with you know when you think about their first album shazam let me forgive you their first album the move freak beat very psychedelic then they have their album shazam which is like a prog masterpiece and then the third one, um, what's it, that album is like kind of all over the place. It has um, elements of um, psychedelia, has elements of um, of art rock and so, but and so on this album over here with songs like um, um, Ella James and, you know, Don't Mess Me Up, you know, what's it, there's a lot of heavy metal influences on here. They're also from Birmingham, you know, what's it, so they've toured with, um, what's it, with Black Sabbath early on. And, you know, a lot of people know about them in the UK, but over here, you know, we only just know them for Do Ya and for California, man. You know, then my second one is from this renowned artist, David Bowie. This is his metal album. You know, what's it, this album over here from the Whiff of a Circle all the way to the last song, the, the amazing version of Superman, just proto metal right there, man. He just put balls to the wall. Right over here, you know, it's a, like whatever you knew about him and so like if you listen to this album and so he fucking kicks ass on this, including the rest of the band, the man who sold the world, David Bowie. Then my last one, you know, is another which a band that we over here know as an electronic band, you know, but which when they had their previous um lead single on their first three albums, it's Ultravox, and it's their second album called Ha Ha Ha, you know, what's that? You know, you think of Ultravox, and so you think about this 80s um, synth pop band, and you're like, nah. But then when you listen to this album, it's totally different. Totally different. What's a three of the members, or what's a that's part of the 80s band, is also on this album. Sounds nothing like it. This album over here is just absolutely, what's a, um, it's metal at times. What's a like hard, hardcore punk? You know, you listen to these guys, you would never know that this album existed from this band. You know, you put this in comparison to Vienna, wouldn't even realize it was the same band. So those are my three picks right there. Ultravox, Ha Ha Ha, um, David Bowie, Man Who Sold the World, and The Move, Message for the Country. Good stuff, Chuck. Yeah, that Move mm -hmm. album cranks, but man, that Bowie album. Oof. Mm -hmm. That's one of his best. That's oh, yeah. right between oh. like his folk stuff like, and the glam mm -hmm. stuff. Like you had that. Oh. And that album just kicks ass, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mick Ronson, baby. Nick. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. To finish this all off, I got three uh, picks here. So the first one, another British band. This uh, These guys are going way back. This Their first album was released in 1970. Originally recorded as a trio, this band was formed from the ashes of the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Vincent Crane on Hammond, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Carl Palmer of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. 
soon thereafter on drums and Nick Graham on bass and vocals. Oh, Mick Rooster. Uh, bass. Mm -hmm. This oh, is yeah. Rooster's mm -hmm. first album. This is really proggy, kind of light, kind of intricate. Uh, they later on, John Ducan on guitar came into the band. They added his guitar work to it afterwards, but not an especially heavy album, but a pretty cool album. Uh, you, you can kind of hear where Carl Palmer would go on to do with uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. You kind of hear that style here. But then once he leaves, they get another drummer in, they get rid of the bass player and they become a trio and they release Death Walks Behind You. Hell yeah. is one of the great proto metal albums of the early yep. 70s. This is like... Yep. Black Sabbath heavy, although a little mm. bit more complex. Uh, kind of, it's like, kind of like Sabbath meets Deep Purple. Yep. Crushing songs. It's doomy. It's dark. It's heavy. I mean, here they. I mean, look at that picture of them right there. Awesome stuff. One of the great unsung heavy albums of the early seventies. Still kind of proggy, but it's mm -hmm. you know, of course, you got the the big riffs of Ducan on here. Uh, just a crushing, crushing album. One of my favorite albums of that time period. So that's my first choice. Um, all right, let's stay in the 70s because my last pick is more contemporary. So some of you might have heard it's George's favorite album of all time. This great album comes out in the late 60s called The Court of the Crimson King by King Crimson. Right? Yeah, it's got, it's got you know, 21st century schizoid man is kind of heavy, but the rest of this is just very kind of like new at the time, symphonic rock and one of the, you know, landmark prog albums of all time. They came out with another couple albums afterwards. Some were kind of weird. Some were kind of jazzy and orchestral. Here's one of them, Islands, right? But this isn't heavy at all. Uh, Robert Fripp, the leader of the band, goes and changes members often, right? He puts together a new lineup of the band, which features Bill Bruford from, comes over from Yes. You got John Wetton, who played in Family and various other things. Jamie Muir is on board as well. And they put out this crazy album called Lark's Tongues and Aspic, which is heavy and ominous mm -hmm. and noisy in spots it's kind of quiet but the guitars mm -hmm. all of a sudden are like kicked up to 11 the bass is really really loud they continue doing more of this kind of thing with starless and bible black again really big and heavy and then this version of the band david cross comes into the band as well on violin and i forgot to mention him and uh and mellotron and then they release this massive Red album heavy. again heavy in spots beautiful and others uh called red and just the, the guitar tones on this album i mean there's there's so so many metal guitar players took lots of inspiration from this period in king crimson so here's a band that went from their kind of humble beginnings and just morphed into this beast of a band and if you see any live footage of them or listen to any live recordings from them from this time period crazy crazy stuff yep Ken, did you want to say something? You look like no, 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 was, no. Come here, oh, sorry. Ken was like, no, it, it was. No, it was. It's been a long day. It has, right? <laughs> Last but not least, uh, we kind of already mentioned them early on, but there's this great band from Sweden called Opeth. Uh, Opeth has a guy who leads the band named Michael Ackerfelt, who, if you read any interviews or you know watch any interviews with him he is a big big fan of like obscure prog and folk and hard rock and all sorts of crazy stuff that nobody's ever heard of he's also a really big fan of the early death metal scene so he puts together this band in the 90s called opeth they release a couple of early albums which are just really really um kind of underground death metal, but still had like long songs and intricate arrangements, right? And over the first couple albums, they're really fine tuning their music. They come out with an album called Still Life, which is, you know, adding wonderful complexity, lots of acoustic guitars, uh, proggy and folky passages, great clean vocals, amazing growling vocals, big epic songs. The Probably the apex of this sound would happen on Blackwater Park, which is one of the great progressive death metal yep. albums of all time, but it's Ever. not just prog, it's folk on here. I mean, just amazingly intricate uh, compositions and just great production values, excellent vocals. And then from there, they go and put out 
this album called Damnation. He starts hanging out with Stephen Wilson. And this is, there's no death metal to be found on here. There's no metal to be found on here. It's all like 70s symphonic prog and folk, lush vocals, acoustic guitars, Mellotron and Hammond organ, electric piano all over the place. So they do that album that their, their fans are like, well, that's really different. Prog fans are like, finally, something I can listen to from Opeth. I don't have to hear the <laughs> vocals. But then they come and they're like, oh, maybe they're going to do more of that. And they release another album right around the same time called Deliverance, which is totally not this and just crushing progressive death metal, right? To keep the people on their toes. Uh, eventually, as I drop everything all over the place, uh, eventually they go back, they start doing albums that are incorporating more and more of the kind of the prog side, less of the death metal side. So they, they eventually do away with all the death metal elements and they basically just have turned into this psychedelic, folky, prog, classic hard rock band. And, you know, like an album like Sorceress, I mean, has elements of like Blue Oyster Cult and Jethro Tull and King Crimson, Camel. Wishbone Camel. Ash, and just completely different bands. So they just, you know, if you really follow the career of Opeth, they've been reinventing themselves all the way. Because even like Still Life in Blackwater Park was an evolution from Orchid and My Arms, Your Hearse and those early albums. And they've just continued to go throughout their career and they keep doing something different. And, you know, they may have lost some of the early fans along the way in recent years, but I think they've gained a lot of, a lot of new ones and uh, we'll see where they take us next. So. Did you go see that, that um, damnation tour, Pete? No, I did not. I, I can tell you this, the fans sure. were not, they were very irritated. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. And, um, I, I, and to make things worse, I, I saw that tour in Maryland in DC actually. And, um, Porcupine Tree was headlining, if you can believe mm. that shit. So the fans are angry, and Michael Okafor has to explain that they they cannot play the heavy shit because they didn't bring the amps, and the drummer doesn't have a double kick drum pedal. So they they actually physically cannot make the sound. So when Porcupine Tree for, then comes out, we all know Stephen Wilson, the man who has a, a a problem wearing fucking shoes on stage, and he goes out there. And um, people, to their credit, they wanted to make their displeasure known. So they didn't try to hurt him. So they just lobbed beer bottles at him. <laughs> Instead of throwing them. Just... <laughs> they just lobbed them. They just say, lobbed. fuck you and fuck off. <laughs> right? So that was the message when, when I saw that tour. So people really, Opeth has a lot of balls to do these things because they really pissed off a lot of people very fast with these changes so that's one of the reasons why i love them to death but um well they keep keep you guessing all the time so it's okay yeah all right so before we uh before we sign off tonight anybody here on the panel have any like questions or feedback of anybody else in their picks and stuff ralph i know you had you had something yep i think you're on ralph, mute ralph. you're on mute ralph, ralph you're mute Sorry, my dog was the one barking before. Ah, that. you were the guilty one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, George talking uh, about Chris Paul, and he's going to be at Chiller Theater next month. I'm going to be be meeting him. But uh, uh, the other thing was that he talked about Toxic, and I just wanted to mention how the drummer Tad Le Leager was uh, also the drummer of Prime Evil. And uh, local Hudson Valley, they were like the legends of our scene back in the 80s, you know. And, uh, yeah, Chris was talking about um, the Wakeman there when they were on tour with Sabbath. I'm in the middle of the Mick Wall book right now. And uh, I had just read about how, like, he, he, he couldn't join at that time because he was, like, having his own drug problems. And to be with them guys who were on drugs, like, insanely at the time it would have he would have died and he was having heart problems and stuff yeah but uh, yeah, that was pretty much it i just uh and I, I can't wait to check out a lot of the bands that everybody has mentioned that there's a lot of a lot of stuff that sounds really cool to me so i'm going to be checking out a lot of this shit well i'm going to take my notes when i rewatch it later Yep. There you go. I, I figured everybody would get some stuff that they hadn't heard before and uh yeah i got sure. a lot of notes a lot of and, stuff to check out I yeah, will say, Ralph. I want to hear yeah. that the Universe Band, Universe Zero. That. Universe, Universe Zero. Zero. Yeah, you you will love Universe Zero. Zero. They're yeah. so good. They're great. They're fucking great. 
Correct. Ralph, that Mick Wall book is probably my favorite Sabbath book. I read uh, the a ACDC book by Mick Wall was my That's favorite ACDC book, and I read so many of them. But yeah, that guy, the way he does it, it's really great. He's really good. He's one of my favorite, uh, like rock and hard rock uh, authors. He's 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 quite good. I mean, there's a lot of good ones. I read, yeah. I read the Iron Maiden one too. The Iron Maiden, the Run to the Hills one. There that you go. Awesome. There it is. <laughs> Good, awesome. good one. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'm glad everybody got some stuff that they want to check out. That's what it's all about. Uh, but most importantly, for all you folks who have been watching us for the last hour, hope you've been taking notes too. Maybe we'll have everybody drop their picks in the comments section as well. So uh, you can go ahead and investigate some of this very cool music. Proggy bands who went heavy, heavy bands who went proggy, all sorts of stuff. There's probably tons of others that we didn't mention, but uh, you know, that's okay because I'm sure you, the viewers, will bring some more to attention in the comments, and that's what it's all about. So thanks everybody for watching this very cool, fun episode here of uh Hudson Valley Squares and in the prog seat. Visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, all together. All, all the damn, damn time. time. Time for Lewis Nasser, Ralph Tambora, Nick Franco, Chuck Alvarez, George Lemie, Ryan Scout, Chris Allo, oh, Ken Golden, and Eric Porter. I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. We'll see you on uh, tomorrow with more stuff. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.